For acute liver failure patients, we don't need to do biopsy. As I said, it's a it's a clinical uh, diagnosis that we make, and there are different criteria which we use, which I'll show in a bit. And uh, early assessment for these patients, and then swift treatment is very very important. Okay, and you also need to know when you should refer these patients for uh, to a transplant center. Okay, so the treatment predominantly is mainly supportive initially. Okay, so you give fluids, fluids, fluids. Okay, you to maintain the hemodynamics. And uh, you correct the, you know, the lactates, uh, the acidosis. Often these patients have hypoglycemia as they're developing into severe failure, so you need to keep looking for that. And you get prophylactic antibiotics, antifungals, PPIs. Um, the only antidote that we know so far is if they have paracetamol overdose is, uh, is in nestalcysteine. Okay. So when, when somebody has got liver failure, they develop encephalopathy. They also develop hypoglycemia. So if they develop hypoglycemia, that means the patient is very, very sick. You know, they're, they're just at the brink of having cerebral edema and they're going to die. So somebody who's got hypoglycemia and a patient with liver failure, you need to act very, very quickly. So how do you actually assess these patients? You uh, you check for the PTINRs 12 hourly. You check the electrolytes, and you also uh, do the blood gas to make sure that the, you correct you correct the, the acidosis. Okay. So serum monitoring of the INR, LFTs uh, do not predict, but what helps is the hypoglycemia and cardiopathy, renal failure, renal function. So you check for all these things uh, 12 hourly and you manage them in the HPA. Okay. So early recognition and referral are very important and transomerase is poorly correlated with the prognosis. Okay. So this is the, the criteria that we use, uh, we used to use in the UK. So, so this is patients who got paracetamol ingestion, ingestion I mean, and uh, Day two, if the RTL pH is less than 7.3, INR is more than 3. If they are uh, having acute kidney injury, creatinine is high, hypoglycemia, that's a referral for a transplant. Okay? So day two, day three, day four. Similarly, for non paracetamol etiologies, you look at encephalopathy, hypoglycemia, coagulation, renal failure, um, and so on and so forth. So it's predominantly what you look at is encephalopathy, coagulopathy and uh, the renal failure, okay? So these are the important uh, criteria that we use. So it's not projected very well, but as you can see, these are the uh, super urgent listing criteria that we, that we used to use uh, in UK. So if you have a, if you tick any of these boxes, they get automatically referred for a super urgent listing for a transplant, okay? So category one, if you paracetamol overdose, and pH is less than 7.25 or more than 24 hours after resuscitation, then that's a category one, okay? The so category two, possible poisoning, coexisting uh, coagulopathy, INR greater than 6.5 and and uh, AKI, and with any grade of encephalopathy, then again, we call it as a great thing, great for encephalopathy, that's saying. So, so on and so forth, there are nine different criteria that we actually use. Anybody ticks these boxes, they get onto the super agent uh, listing for a, a, a transplant. Okay, so cerebral edema correlates very well with the, well, encephalopathy correlates very well with cerebral edema. So if you have grade 4 encephalopathy, there's almost a 75% chance that you will get cerebral edema. So if you, if you have somebody with grade 3 and grade 4 encephalopathy, you intubate these patients. Okay, so grade 1, grade 2, you can manage them in the ward, but if you have anything above, uh, uh, around 2 and above, then you actually shift them to ITU and then you intubate these uh, patients. Okay. So different anti-encephalopathy measures and anti cerebral edema measures that we that we use. Okay, like uh, you maintain the, the perfusions uh, to avoid any hypoperfusion. Um, there's something called bolting, which we actually check intra intra uh, cranial pressures with the mannitol, head elevation 30 degrees. Give you maintain purposefully the sodium above 150 so that you reduce the cerebral edema. Um, you hyperventilate these patients, you hyper, 
purposely put them in a hypothermium uh, state and then you give minimal tactile stimulation. So, you know, intratracheal intubation after that, you just won't keep uh, sucking uh, the, the tracheal tube, okay? So you give antiepileptics also to keep the brain uh, calm out. Okay, so along with that, this, you maintain your uh, cardiorespiratory needle supports, infection uh, risk, so you actually give antifungals, prophylactically give antifungals also and anti antibiotics, and uh, you keep correcting the cardiopathy. But please do not give FFPs unless you think that the patient is having life-threatening uh, bleeds. Okay, so early recognition transfer of the patient's liver unit. Uh, is very important for patients who once you take a criteria for the liver failure. Okay, so I'll just end up with a couple of cases that I have uh, here. So this is a chap who is a 46 year old male who got referred with ALT of 2000 and AST of 3000 and INR of 3 and believe it was about 350 micromoles. Okay, and uh, he didn't have any encephalopathy, BMs were stable, there was no paracetamol overdoses. And uh, he had a background history of anxiety and depression. He used to live alone. He had drug uh, abuse. Uh, no, he didn't have drug abuse of that transfusion um, uh, when he had a road traffic accident 20 years back. Um, so he had augment in game by his GP six weeks ago. He's otherwise looking fit and well. There was no encephalopathy. So you got a patient who has got raised transaminases, a bit of a coagulopathy, and jaundice. Okay. So imaging um, patent vessels. So what we want to look at in the imaging is we want to look at if they have any acute butt carry. Some people can present with acute butt carry with acute liver failure. Okay. So the hepatic veins IVC was patent. Autoimmune screen was negative. Hep A, D are negative. The IgM core antibody is very high, positive. Okay. Now, interestingly, also hepatitis, sorry, HPSA surface antigen was positive and E antigen was positive. So do you think this patient has got acute FB or he had a reactivation? What do you think is going on? It's already got HBSG positive. It's it's very unlikely to have an acute FB and then you have HBSG positive. And then you also have E antigen positive. So it's, a, it's got a high chance of uh, infectivity and he's actually had a reactivation of the of the happy. Okay. And his previous, previous imaging did not show any evidence of any cirrhosis or fibrosis. Okay, so this patient, INR was still hanging around 2.5, Billy was about 450, still didn't have an NKFL, but this is about a week, uh, five days to week, uh, week later. Um, then he was transferred to us. We started him on um, Tenofovir, which is an antiviral, heavy antiviral. He remained well, you know, we just kept him up, uh, under observation. His age started coming down. So we thought probably he was getting better. But what worried was that the billy was still climbing and INR was stuck around 2, 2.5, okay? So, we, you know, this is an important message here because if you just look at the enzymes itself after starting HEP-B, if you think the enzymes are coming down, that doesn't mean that the patient is actually improving, okay? We kept observing this patient in the ward because we got worried that the billy is still climbing and the INR didn't, didn't, uh, didn't go down. Um, I remember this patient on Monday morning, we just went to the ward round and he suddenly started having a flap. Okay, so once he develops a flap, that's, unless you do a transplant, they have a very, very high mortality. Particularly you've got a coagulopathy, you've got NCAF, uh, the jaundice, and then you develop a flap, okay? So if it fits the criteria of having acute liver failure, if you see the, the, the criteria, okay? Um, so you got, uh, super agent listed for a liver transplant and within 24 hours he had a transplant. So when we looked at the 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 the, uh, the explant of it was all shrunken uh, cirrhotic liver. Okay, so in a patient who had normal looking liver on the imaging before, within three weeks he developed cirrhotic and uh, spinomegaly and cirrhotic liver with portal tension. So that that's how rapidly he was progressing. So this is where he had transplant. I'm sure the numbers are not, I mean, you, you won't be able to see very well, but this is where he had a transplant and his numbers started improving after that. So he had a 
shrunken uh, liver, he also had ascites by then. Okay, so he, he got a good liver, um, and uh, we given uh, the heavy immunoglobulins at the time of the transplant, and then we we gave back uh, the immunoglobulins afterwards also. Okay, so he did well um, after that. 